Teleology is a word of Greek origin. It is composed of two Greek words, teleos, which means end or aim or goal, and logos, which means reason, logic, or explanation. Teleological is giving the reason or explanation of something as a function of its end, its ultimate purpose, its final goal, as opposed to as a function of its physical cause. For example, the physical cause of a nail going into a piece of wood is the person hammering it. But the reason he is hammering it, the end for which he is hammering it, is to build a cabinet for his house. Human beings are teleological creatures. They are always choosing with the intention of reaching some goal, large or small. Jesus is totally human, and therefore, as a human being, makes his choices with some goal in mind, ultimate or transitory. When the nonviolent Jesus of the Gospels enters Jerusalem on the first Palm Sunday, knowing full well that there are men of great violence lurking there, waiting for the opportunity to kill him, is he ultimately going there to stop by nonviolent means any violence directed at him or others? If not, then for what end is the Jesus of the gospel, the Jesus of nonviolent love of friends and enemies, freely and knowingly, symbolically riding on an anti-violence, anti-war symbol, that is, the cult of an ass, see Zechariah 9.9, into Jerusalem, which at that time, in terms of him, is a haunt's honest, honest nest of hate and evil that lays waiting for him. Is his ultimate intention to nonviolently stop the Roman government from oppressing the Jewish people? Or to become king of the Jews? Or to at least become a significant player in making the rules of the political game? The Gospel texts do not allow for a very high probability that any such ultimate goals are the reason Jesus chose to go to Jerusalem when he did and as he did. Somewhere along the road to adulthood, Jesus of Nazareth recognized early in life, before he was 12 years old even, Outside of God's will, there was no genuine or lasting life, hope, love, peace, revolution, or salvation. He realized that if the cacophony of evil and death, which haunts all humanity, were to be silenced, and a peaceful harmony restored to human existence, then God would have to orchestrate it, and Jesus would have to be his willing instrument. Nothing was clearer to Jesus than the fact that all attempts by an instrument to lead the band were doomed to perpetuate the cacophony of evil and its consequent suffering and death. To substitute one's own ideas on how to conquer evil and death for God's ideas on how to conquer evil and death was, and still is, in the strict sense of the word, 
absurd. With a maturity beyond his 12 years, Jesus knew and struggled to live from an early age the meaning of what T.S. Eliot called, quote, the most profound line in literature, quote, our peace is in your will, from Dante's Paradiso, Canto Three. For a human being to commit his or her life to doing the will of, the, of him, himself, is one thing. For a human being to commit his or her life to doing the will of his or her creator is another thing and is obviously the same most rational commitment to make. Human beings self-evidently know auto-salvation is beyond them. The problem arises, however, in answering the question, what is the will of the Creator? Said another way, the problem arises with the question, what kind of God, Creator, is God? And what does God, the Creator, expect from his human creatures? The text of the Gospel makes clear that by the age of 12, Jesus is acutely aware that God is a loving Father and that he, Jesus, must be about his Father's business. How he lives and grows in this understanding of God and God's will between the ages of 12 and 30 years old is lost to recorded history. But sometime around the age of 30, Jesus becomes intensely conscious of what doing the Father's will specifically entails for his life in his time, in his place. This happens when he is baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist when he rises out of the waters of the Jordan River, he hears the words, the revelation from heaven. This is my beloved son, or servant, in whom I am well pleased. Here Matthew is referencing to Isaiah 42, 1 and following. The opening of the hymn of the suffering servant sometimes called the song of the, of the servant of Yahweh. It is said in Isaiah 42, 1 and following of the suffering servant that he does not shout or raise his voice in the streets, is so gentle that he will not snuff out the smoldering wick or break the bruised reed and that he goes to his murderous death like a lamb led to slaughter. Yet it continues to say, through him, salvation will come to the ends of the earth. In a nutshell, the suffering servant is the communication from God that innocent suffering responded to with love is the dynamic, the power, through which salvation comes to humanity. John L. McKinsey, the most renowned biblical scholar of the mid-20th century in the Catholic Church, says it is remarkable that the words Jesus hears from heaven at his baptism are almost an exact quotation of Isaiah 42.1. He writes 
in his dictionary of the Bible that the fourth song of the suffering servant is a major crook's interpretum of the Old Testament. And in his chapter on the servant of Yahweh, the suffering servant, in his interpretation of the New Testament, the power and the wisdom, he writes, when we come to the theme of the suffering servant as proclaimed in the New Testament, we are at the very center of the Christian revolution. Jesus is very clear in the Gospels. He comes only to do the will of the Father, nothing else. Even in the absolute human crisis moment in Gethsemane, his desire and his words are, not my will, but your will be done. He lives to do the will of the Father, who he knows is love, agape, a love completely devoid of violence. His goal or purpose ultimately in choosing to go to Jerusalem is to go where the will of the Father wants him to go and when there to do what the will of the Father desires and directs him to do. The teleology of Jesus, every thought, word, and deed is to do the will of the Father on earth as it is done in heaven. Jesus knew that the only hope of conquering evil and death in the human situation was by the power of God, the Father, which is love, and which could be activated in the human situation by the human will voluntarily in its freedom uniting with the will of God and thereby thinking, speaking, and acting out of that unity. So Jesus so chose to do. The cost to him was astronomical. The consequences unknown to him, hidden in an unfathomable and invisible future, at the moment of his decision to do the Father's will. All Jesus knows on that first Good Friday is that the will of the Father and his mission, Jesus' mission, in this world, both of which were revealed to him on the occasion of his baptism by John. This is the peak of faith. This is the peak of Jesus' faith. To believe under an absolute crisis situation of life and death in God's way when he himself understands nothing of how it will ever work out. When obedience to God's will seems absurd and contradicts what common sense communicates. To believe in God more than in himself, to rely on God more than to trust in his own limited reason, perception, in thinking as a human being, when mind-breaking suffering and death are the cost of fidelity, is a faith choice, a radical faith choice. And to do this, you have to believe that the Father who is love wants this of you 
in order to reveal himself as an infinitely loving and forgiving God that no son or daughter need fear and in order to save humanity from evil and eternal death and to bring all of his father's sons and daughters into everlasting communion with the eternally holy. Here is a video that will give one a little taste of what Jesus chose in his love for his fellow human beings and in fidelity to the Father's loving plan for the redemption of all creatures with free will. With a slight bit of empathy and sympathetic imagination, it may engender a love for Jesus and a most fervent thank you, Jesus, as well as an ardent desire to follow Jesus, to participate with him in the only way by which humanity can be saved, the way of the suffering servant, the way of nonviolent love of friends and enemies, even lethal enemies. So let us, let us now view this little, this little video that may help us, just may help us identify with Jesus as our loving God and Savior and may bring us to love as he loved for the sake of the eternal salvation of all people. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes, we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. So it is written, so it happened. to become part of an extraordinary event, a journey back in time to witness the death of the man called Jesus as you've never seen it before. The ultimate forensic investigation of the cruelest and most gruesome method of capital punishment and its most famous victim. Crucifixion is a ghastly, lingering, painful way to die. It's an exceptionally awful form of punishment. Of course, the most famous victim of crucifixion was Jesus of Nazareth. Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, was, uh, as best it can be identified now, a um, little knob of a hill just outside the old city wall of Herod's Wall. Uh, walking into the city, you would either see the place of execution or you would see people undergoing execution. The whole weight of the body is pulling against the nail. There's a symphony of pain. Crucifixion was so disgustingly and blatantly horrible as a punishment that the message of the sight of it was... This could happen to you. If you resist us, this could happen to you. A 
on the last evening of his life, Jesus makes his way to the upstairs room of a house in Jerusalem. He has come for dinner with his 12 disciples. Afterward, in keeping with his usual custom, he and his followers walk to the hills east of the city walls. It's quite dark. It's nothing at all like a modern village or city or town where we rely upon so much light. The only light that people have is from a fire or from a very small oil lamp with a very small flame. Their destination is a public garden where Jesus often goes to rest or pray. It is called Gethsemane. And since Gethsemane is a contraction or a uh, corruption of Gat Shemin, we know that it means olive press. So it's an olive orchard, probably freshly plowed. They've been tending the olive trees. Uh, usually flowers are planted around it because the ideal in the ancient Near East of, um, of real beauty is like the Garden of Eden. So it would be a, a beautiful place to rest, relax. But on this night, Jesus is preoccupied. By the time he and his disciples reach Gethsemane, Jesus is becoming aware of the terrible ordeal that lies ahead. In the garden, Jesus goes off by himself to think about the events to come. It's written that his anguish is so great that his sweat becomes like great drops of blood falling to the ground. The sweating of blood called hematidrosis is actually a clinical term because there have been many cases of it. It was first described by Aristotle. Now around the sweat glands themselves, there are multiple blood vessels in a net-like form. Under the pressure of great stress, these blood vessels constrict until anxiety is replaced by resignation. Suddenly the reversal occurred, the blood vessels dilated to the point of rupture into the sweat glands. Concomitantly, the sweat glands started to produce a lot of sweat, pushing the blood to the surface, coming out as droplets of blood. There's a kind of teamwork between the, um, the Roman rulers on top and the civilian population. And it encourages uh, the maximum of mutual suspicion among the civilian population, the maximum of, call them whistleblowers if you like them, or fingers, rat finks if you don't, who uh, will betray to the authorities someone they think needs to be punished. It is one of his own disciples who turns on Jesus. Judas Iscariot has heard the angry rumblings among the temple priests whose teachings are being challenged by Jesus. And so he offers them a deal. He will deliver Jesus to them for a price. They pay him 30 pieces of silver. Now as a medical examiner uh, whose specialty is determining a mechanism, manner, and cause of death, I would start at Gethsemane I'd see the fluid loss from the intensive sweating. I'd see the loss from the blood. Pain is always mental. It's felt in our brain. It's always up there. And whether it's due to an injury of the finger, the arm, the stomach, or whatever, or it is due to some biochemical changes in the brain itself, due to emotional factors, the pain is there. In the garden, when it's time for uh, the crowd to come and arrest Jesus, the crowd sent by the high priest and so forth, uh, they have to deal with the fact that it's dark. So, with torches and lanterns to light the way, the traitor Judas leads an armed guard from the chief priests to the spot where he knows Jesus and his followers like to gather. But there is one problem. All these men are wearing white. They all have their heads covered, and they all have beards. So Judas says, the one I kiss is the one you arrest. This 
arrest of Jesus uh, would not appear to most people to be uh, anything to uh, inquire too strongly about because people are arrested all the time. For all they know, he could have been a thief or anything. They can't tell who he is in the dark. They know that something official is going on. They can probably hear the rattle and clink of some armor and some, some weaponry. So they know somebody's been arrested and is being taken in, but it's nothing to comment on. During the long night, Jesus is interrogated, mocked, and finally charged with blasphemy. His accusers are the Sanhedrin, men of great age, great wealth, and great influence, whose fear has brought them together at this dark hour. They had a lot to lose, so that just like the Roman governors, they didn't want too much going on underneath them. And if there were such a tremendously crowded and combustible moments in high festivals, they would play, uh, play the game of the Roman governors for obvious reasons. They want to keep the tiger in the cage. They want to keep the population um, behaving itself. Jesus has been betrayed, arrested, and charged with the serious crime of blasphemy, punishable by death his condition begins to deteriorate. You have to remember that Jesus did not have anything to drink or eat since the Last Supper. In addition to that, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane thereafter, and he had no sleep at all. He was literally exhausted. Then the hematidrosis occurred, which caused him to lose a lot of fluid. This would have a profound effect on the body. Found and under guard, Jesus is taken before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who alone has the power to exact the sentence of death. Pilate, like any other governor, had to be careful to uh, keep his backside safe. The backside being what the emperor thought about him. And uh, um, that backside could be reached by the influence of Jewish leaders of the uh, uh, royal house of the, of the Jews, that is the descendants of, of King Herod. They had uh, very close ties with some of the imperial family. And from time to time, they, they exerted that influence on the emperor indirectly so as to uh, protect themselves or protect their own people from a bad governor. And the governors were well aware of this. After questioning the prisoner, Pilate makes a decision. Perhaps the Sanhedrin will be satisfied with a lesser but still brutal punishment, scourging. We have a lot of descriptions from the ancient world for the flagrum, as it's called, for um, scourging prisoners, for beating them. Typically, it's simply a wooden handle covered with leather to which are attached leather, thin leather straps. These leather straps, depending upon how how much damage you want to inflict, can have little balls or knots attached to the end. You might just knot it, or you might actually attach a small lead or bone, or rather dumbbell-looking device, which when flicked, as it were, by, with considerable strength by the uh, person doing the beating, actually whips around the body and embeds in the flesh. Then when it's pulled out, uh, one bleeds profusely. So as the beating progresses, it spatters blood. You actually get a shower, a fine mist of blood everywhere. In the case of the scourging, we're going to get a fluid loss from intensive sweating. But even more importantly, across the chest area will cause what they call pleural effusion, or fluid built up around the lungs. Whenever you lose fluid or blood, the body will go into shock. The blood pressure goes down, uh, the heart rate uh, uh, increases. Uh, in this case, the blood pressure uh, may go down as low as 80, uh, 70 or 80. There are situations 
where the stress and the fatigue in markedly increases the sensitivity of the pain. I mean, the same amount of impulses are going in, but the patient feels it more. And that occurs very frequently uh, after injuries. Across the prisoner's raw and bleeding back, the Roman soldiers drape a rough cloth robe. And in an added moment of cruel mockery, they fashion a circle of thorns and push it onto his head. The patient, as soon as uh, thorns were placed, would have uh, severe pain in the areas of the thorns, and within minutes, it would involve the whole head, uh, and eventually also involve the neck, and it starts to spread to the uh, shoulders. The two nerves that supply the head, the front part is supplied by a branch of the trigeminal nerve and the back part by the greater occipital nerve. Now, when these nerves are irritated, they cause severe pain. Over time, the condition can become unbearable. All of a sudden, the patient has a sharp shooting pain either in one of the three branches of the nerve or the whole nerve, and it causes them to freeze and, in fact, uh, many, many of these people will commit suicide. By mid-morning, it becomes clear that the scourging of Jesus is not going to appease the temple leaders. And so Pilate, wishing to be done with this bothersome matter, at last gives the order, crucify him. When someone's sentenced to crucifixion, he's handed over by the, uh, the, the governor, because only the governor can give the sentence, to whatever muscle is present in the, uh, uh, in the barracks. There was, of course, a big division in that part of the world between Jew and Gentile. And the troops that the Romans used, and which the Jewish kings also used when they were on top and sovereign, were Gentiles. I imagine they were uh, distinguishable in the streets, these Roman soldiers, by a kind of uh, sassy swagger and a willingness to um, sp spin in your eye and a deep knowledge of dirty words to aim at the uh, Jewish population. And it's perfectly believable that they would have applied not only the, the legitimate strength necessary to take their prisoner and conduct him out to the place of execution, but amuse themselves also by acts of uh, cruelty and mockery, which they, Gentiles, would, uh, would certainly feel toward a, uh, a Jewish culprit. the condemned man is forced to carry the instrument of his own death along narrow, crowded streets. The patibulum is heaved upon the wounded shoulders and back of Jesus. His body sags under the weight. The cross itself is a very heavy timber. Although it's going to be reused many times, the objective is to make it last a long time. The timber is unfinished. It's not a lovely sanded down timber. It's just cut out with adds, so it's quite rough and even injures the skin when it's being carried. Here I'm saying my, now he's in a beginning state of shock. I see this brutal beating which would cause traumatic shock. I see the blood uh, uh, losses from the uh, injuries to the skin all over. I see the intensive sweating and I see this fluid accumulation around the lungs, the pleural effusion. Here I'm saying my, now he's in a beginning state of shock. I can't imagine how a person who's been whipped or has been 
uh, uh, injured in, in ways would be expected to carry a very heavy load. I would uh, anticipate that uh, the average individual would not be able to tolerate that for more than a few feet. the death procession begins its slow ascent to the place of execution. A loathsome rise of rocky earth where the city discards its human trash. Golgotha, the place of the skull. That is uh, where orphans who died in the streets were disposed of and where criminals uh, whom nobody cared for were tossed out to be uh, uh, eaten by whatever dogs and birds of prey came around. At night, uh, there'd be scurrying, there'd be rats. Uh, it's a very, very unpleasant uh, place to be. There were, outside Rome, uh, similar stretches of the uh, northeastern part of the city wall, which were excavated a little over 100 years ago. They had served uh, for the disposal of the, um, uh, the uh, human remainder of the very large urban population. That is, bodies were simply thrown out into a, a gigantic ditch there. And when they were excavated in the 1890s, uh, by then uh, filled up with the um, accumulated earth of, of all the intervening centuries, that earth was still putrescent and so disgusting in stench that the uh, diggers had to go on uh, short spells of 15 or 20 minutes before they were relieved. This is, uh, around every ancient city as I imagine it, a necessary part of great poverty and uh, limited lifespan. The question, why Jesus ended up crucified in Golgotha, who wanted him dead, and why did they want him dead, is very hard to give a simple answer to. Uh, it's a non-answer, but a true thing to say he was crucified because two focuses of force wanted him dead. I think the Jewish leadership was uh, uh, agitated about Jesus as a challenge to them on religious grounds, and the uh, governor, who couldn't care less, of course, about uh, Orthodox or any other kind of Judaism, was concerned that the um, uh, urban, especially the poor population, should not become tumultuous and uh, cause him administrative trouble. He was quite used to handling people of, of uh, no standing, no importance, uh, no clout or dignity, who got in the way, who were troublesome. And uh, I doubt if it troubled him very much to deal arbitrarily with them. The Roman soldiers make quick work of the prisoner. Jesus is stripped of his clothing with brutal indifference to the open wounds that cover his body. When the skin is abraced or uh, the outer part of the skin is removed because of the injury, there's oozing. And the oozing, of course, attaches to the cloth. And uh, removal of the cloth causes severe burning pain. Now think of those occurrences of where you've had a gauze pad that clotted to a wound. And you had a friend that said, hey, let me take it off. I know an easy way. And he grabs it and he yanks it off. Think of that little bit of pain. Now think of the same pain all over the entire body where this has clotted to 
all these multiple wounds. The victim of crucifixion typically is naked. This is to increase shame. Yeah. And that's also symbolic. He's helpless. He can't do anything. He has not a shred of anything with him that he could use to defend himself or get out of this or escape. That was part of the intent of people running the empire to um, maximize the indignity and advertise it as a part of their display of power. Jesus has endured hours of misery, but the worst of the ordeal is yet to come. The nails that are used, uh, we have many of them uh, excavated here and there. They're usually quite long. Uh, they have a very large uh, head. The shank is square in cross-section. They're forged. They're quite pointed because they're to be driven into very large timbers, that is, through the person and into the wood. In quick succession, the nails are pounded into his feet and hands. There are many uh, cases in which, for example, an, an injury to the hand uh, from a bullet or from a, even a, a, a knife would cause what is called causalgia, and initially the pain is felt just where the injury is. If the median nerve is ruptured or injured, it will also cause severe, excruciating, burning-like pain, like lightning bolts traversing the arm into the spinal cord. Now, we know from experiences and during war, especially World War II, where did studies on a condition called causalgia which is a condition caused by injuring the median nerve. The pain was so terrific that even morphine wouldn't help. And they had to actually operate on the spinal column in order to decrease uh, that pain or to eliminate uh, that type of pain. And it's so severe that if you blow on the skin of the hand where the pain is, the patient would scream abnormally. When a nail pierces the top of the foot, goes through the top of the foot, whether it went through uh, each foot separately or both feet, it would rupture or at least injure the plantar nerves, which go down in between each of the bones. The pain would be very similar to that of the hand because causalgia is the same medical condition, uh, causing severe lightning bolt-like pains right up the legs, burning, searing type of pains. Suffering that's occurring now on a cross is really multiple at this point. There's a symphony of pain with every movement pushing against the badly scourged back against the upright, the head pushing against the crown of thorn, the uh, median nerve uh, irritation up each arm, up each leg at the same time, the cramping, the joint pains, the intense thirst. Jesus cries out that he's thirsty. We have some debate about the nature of the drink that, that Jesus has offered on the cross. The drink, if it's mulled wine, would uh, 
the objective of that would be to drug the person somewhat. It'd be sort of a, actually be rather a nice thing to do. See, he's undergoing all this horrific pain, so let's give him a little mulled wine. On the other hand, some people think that on occasion this is really a, a bitter, an embittered drink, which is really to increase the suffering. Often with crucifixion, the victim lingers for days. But in the case of Jesus, it is only hours before his body experiences the final torment. As the individual is standing uh, on uh, this cross, it would cause severe changes in the function of uh, many parts of the body. For example, the stomach would stop functioning uh, altogether. Uh, the heart will beat uh, a more faster and faster up to a certain point when it may go into failure. After a period of time, you would say the lips would protrude from the mouth. The tongue swells. There's a point where the blood supply, even though the heart is pumping like crazy, the blood going to the muscle is not enough to meet the, de uh, the metabolic demands of the muscle. And so the body says, stop, by uh, causing severe excruciating pain. At this point, the tongue would have dried practically against the roof of the mouth. At a distance, keeping vigil, are the women who have faithfully followed Jesus during his public life. They will not leave him until it is over. They do not have long to wait. The lance that they use to pierce Jesus' side is often thought of today as something that one throws. That's a spear. A lance is a thrusting weapon. It does not leave your hand. The last about uh, two feet are typically made of iron with a nice wide blade because you want to do as much damage as possible when you pierce the body. fusion which has gathered around the lungs, had filled up around the lungs, uh, would be present when the spear entered the cavity. The spear would hit the heart and be pulled out rapidly. It was very quickly done. It would pull out blood followed by water. Jesus has suffered the decisive blow. After three hours of hanging on the cross, death is imminent. The blood pressure is very low now at this particular time because of the large volume loss and the traumatic shock. The individual is taking deep breaths in order to make the lungs exchange uh, more oxygen for the small amount of blood that's being pumped. The heart is beginning to fail as a pump. The, the, the legs are starting to swell. And then it is finished. In my medical opinion, the cause of death was due to shock, three types. Hypovolemic shock, which is a loss of blood and fluid volume. Traumatic shock, which was due to all of the injuries inflicted. And cardiogenic shock, which was a consequence of the first two types of shock, where the heart fails as a pump. Crucifixion, behold the victim, a silent testament to unimaginable human savagery.